what, how can a, how can, what's a meme made of? And yesterday, uh, Negroponte was talking about viral telecommunication. But uh, what's a virus? A virus is a string of nucleic acid with attitude. <laughs> That is, there's something about it that tends to make it replicate better than the competition does. And that's what a meme is, is an information packet with attitude. What's a meme made of? What are bits made of, Mom? Not silicon. They're made of information. It can be carried in any physical medium. What's a word made of? Sometimes when people say, do memes exist? I say, well, do words exist? Are they in your ontology? If they are, words are memes that can be pronounced. Then there's all the other memes that can't be pronounced. They're different, different species of memes. Remember the shakers? Gift to be simple, 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 beautiful furniture. And of course, they're basically extinct now. And one of the reasons is that among the creed of Shakerdom is that one should be celibate, not just the priests, everybody. Say, well, <laughs> not so surprising that they've, <laughs> that they've gone extinct. But in fact, that's not why they went extinct. They survived as long as they did at a time when the social safety nets weren't there and there were lots of widows and orphans, people like that, who needed, who needed a foster home. And so they had a ready supply of converts, and they could keep it going. And in principle, it could have gone on forever, with perfect celibacy on the part of the hosts, the idea being passed on through proselytizing <coughs> instead of through the gene line. So the ideas can live on in spite of the fact that they're not being passed on. Genetically. A meme can flourish in spite of having a negative impact on genetic fitness. After all, the meme for Shakerdom was essentially a sterilizing parasite. There are other parasites which do this, which render the hosts sterile. It's part of their plan. They don't have to have minds to have a plan. I'm just going to draw your attention to just one of the many implications of the mimetic perspective uh, which I recommend. Not time to go into more of it. In Jared Diamond's wonderful book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, he talks about how it was germs more than guns and steel that conquered the new hemisphere, the western hemisphere that conquered the rest of the world. When European explorers and travelers uh, uh, spread out, they brought with them the germs that they had become essentially immune to, that they had learned how to tolerate over hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years of living with domesticated animals that were the sources of those pathogens. And they just wiped out, these pathogens just wiped out the native people who had no immunity to them at all. And we're doing it again. We're doing it this time with toxic ideas. Yesterday, a number of people, Nicholas Negroponte and others, spoke about all the wonderful things that are happening when our ideas get spread out thanks to all the new technology all over the world. And I agree, it is largely wonderful, largely wonderful. But among all those ideas that inevitably flow out into the whole world, thanks to our technology, are a lot of toxic ideas. Now this has been realized for some time. Here, Syed Qutb is one of the founding fathers of fanatical Islam, one of the one of the ideologues that inspired Osama bin Laden. One has only to glance at its press films, fashion shows, beauty contests, ballrooms, wine bars, and broadcasting stations. Memes. These memes are spreading around the world, and they are wiping out whole cultures. They are wiping out languages, 
They are wiping out traditions and practices. And it's not our fault any more than it's our fault when our germs lay waste to people that haven't developed the immunity. We have an immunity to all of the junk that lies around the edges of our culture. We free society, so we let pornography and all these things, you know, we, eh, we shrug them off. They're, they're, they're like a mild cold. They're not a big deal for us. But we should recognize that for many people in the world, they are a big deal. And we should be very alert to this as we spread our education and our technology. One of the things that we are doing is we're the vectors of means that are correctly viewed by the hosts of many other means as a dire threat to their favorite means, the means that they are prepared to die for. Well, now, how are we going to tell the good means from the bad means? That is not the job of mimetics, of the science of mimetics. Mimetics is morally neutral. And so it should be. This is not the place for hate and anger. It's, if you've had a friend who's died of AIDS, then you, you hate the HIV virus. But the way to deal with that is to do science and understand how it spreads and why in a morally <coughs> neutral perspective. Get the facts, work out the implications. There's plenty of room for moral passion once we've got the facts and can figure out the best thing to do. And as with germs, the trick is not to try to annihilate them. You will never annihilate the germs. What you can do, however, is foster pro uh, public health measures and the like that will encourage the evolution of a virulence, that will encourage the spread of relatively benign mutations of the most toxic varieties. That's all the time I have. So uh, thank you very much for your attention.